Head into our last section, addressing anti-black racism. Why is it important for our communities to care about anti-black racism? Well, good evening, everybody. I'm, I'm going to cop out. I'm not going to address that issue. Um, I have been deeply affected by what I've heard already, and I will share with you a couple things. It, it really is a shame that we ask the victims to solve the problem. It is always the ones with the power who are responsible. It is never the ones who are the powerless. And so I thought about that in the context of the church. And, and I've said this to Raymond probably eight or 10 times in the last three weeks. That, that what I feel is this, if we as leaders, especially people like myself who are senior leaders, I think we have to reorient our priorities. The, the context of victims having to fight is illogical. Victims are compromised. I appeal to my white, evangelical, brothers especially, and sisters, that if you want the Christ of the Bible to be real, you're going to have to stop holding yourself apart from what's going on. I have lost some friends and I'm prepared to lose some others because we won't talk to our congregations truthfully. What I've been amazed at is th these stories, as traumatic as they are, are not accepted in most spheres of power. No one can listen to these panelists and deny the truth of what they've said. So why is it so hard for those in power? I mean, in the church. I'm talking exclusively today about the church. The church. The church. The church must, must understand its responsibility. And, and Charlie went there, and, and, and they will tell you, Charlie, that my whole sermon was about principalities and powers. We don't want to talk about those things. They're too spooky, but they're real. Look, I'm a scientist. It's illogical for a community that has been devastated by COVID to be reluctant to buy in to the therapy for COVID because they're afraid they're going to be further marginalized. And at the same time, they're dying every day. So it's got to be a principality. It's got to be something that is not logical, so it has to be demonic. Now, you may get a little bit nervous about that, but I, I preached yesterday, which kingdom and which king? Because on, on, on Palm Sunday, they were shouting Hosanna, and Jesus was weeping because he understood that the obvious reason was not the real reason he was riding into Jerusalem. And so we're going to have to, as a church, stop punking out and stop starting new churches everywhere and, and going to the foreign lands and starting stuff. We need to change the church in America. America is filthy rich. America has resources that no other country has. America has something that it is responsible for, and it's called power and authority. And I, and I beg all of us as we leave here tonight, and I said this to Raymond, I hope this is not simply an event. I'm tired of events. 
I'm tired of having these sessions and then we go back because I believe that we got the power and the authority in the Holy Spirit if we unite together, if we stop having the Asian Americans only on these days in our churches, we're going to always be that way. Here's the last two things I will say. I'm a pediatrician. I was involved with one of the world's foremost leader development teams. You know them by name recently. And one of, the, one of the perks of me being involved with them, we were able to play golf at Pebble Beach. Those who are golfers know Pebble Beach is like the pinnacle of playing golf. And here's this black boy from the ghetto, Horace Smith, playing golf at Pebble Beach. And one of my cart partners happened to be a very nice white gentleman who shared with me, he and his group were committed to adopting black children to make sure they, they would have a better life. And I lost it on that card. And I had to repent. Because I lost it. I was angry at him. Here's a white man who's doing good. I was angry at him. And I said to him, why is it that white people have to adopt black kids? That is an insult to me. Because you adopting them may help that kid, but it justifies the hundreds of thousands who are not going to be helped, and I'm sick and tired of it. And I said, Horace, what happened to you? And I realized that until good white people begin to speak up and, and speak out, against the inherent racism because in this year of COVID, hundreds of thousands of black kids who are already behind the eight ball educationally are gonna lose even more and gonna be justifiably ostracized because of good white people saying they couldn't cut the mustard. That's a lie. If you create an environment, I can put the kids from Winneka right here in Phillips High School, and the outcome will be the same. It's got nothing to do with the ethnicity or the racial background of these people. It's because we're fighting against a system that is wretchedly, inherently unjust, and it needs to be dismantled. A Band-Aid ain't going to help. And so, if we don't, as the church, who's against abortion, but ensures that the penitentiaries are filled with black and brown young men, I don't want to hear your gospel because it is not relevant. It is not relevant. It is not relevant to be against abortion, but you allow black children to be underfed and uneducated, and I've lost it. i got to stop now. Yeah. See, I'm getting old, and I'm tired of this piddling, drip, 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 let's get something changed. And I will close by saying this. Uh, I've, I've, in our denomination, I became the presiding bishop. And under my tenure, I made sure that women could become bishops. Yeah, and, and, and they said to me, that's because you are a father with three daughters and no sons. I said, no, it's because on the day of Pentecost, he poured out his spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters prophesied. I'm sick of this traditional, cultural, evangelical outlook that is not biblical. Whether I went to Deerfield or not is irrelevant, and I've gone too far, and I'm going to stop right here. Good luck following that. <laughs> I'm a little uh, angry at Ray Chang right now for making me go last. <laughs> and for especially making me go after Bishop Smith. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about um, Black Lives Matter from an Asian American perspective. And um, 
I come at this from a, a bit of an unusual life experience. So my wife and I um, live with our family in the Lawndale neighborhood of Chicago. So it's an African-American, low-income neighborhood on the west side. Um, we've been there for the last decade, and we worship at Lawndale Christian Community Church. And the funny thing about the last 10 years is that I've learned more about my Asian-American racial identity by living in a black neighborhood <laughs> than I did growing up in Asian-American circles my whole life. It's been a little strange. So I want to share a little bit of Asian-American history so that we understand a little bit more about what goes on between Asian and black communities, um, because the relationship is, is very complicated. And, you know, Reverend Moss started us off so well to show how our histories are intertwined. But the histories are have also been pitted against each other, and we should also talk about how that works. So some of you might be familiar with this term, the model minority, the myth of the model minority. So Asians are always set up as the best racial minority, and they're set up as if we are better than black and brown folks. That's, right. That's pretty much the way that works. Where did that story come from? It came from a very specific time. It came in 1966. Mm. It came when the civil rights movement was still going on, but African Americans and Latinos were seeing they were not getting enough gains, and society was still being slow to move. And it was in that context that a series of white writers said, we're not giving welfare to black or brown folks because this country is not racist. And if you want proof of how it's not racist, just look at the Asians. Mm -hmm. They work hard. They don't cause trouble. They don't protest for their rights. Oh. So why can't black and brown folks just be like Asians, and then everybody will just be quiet and stop complaining? Now, there's a lot of reasons why the model minority myth is wrong. One of them is that it actually ignores immigration history, which is that Asians actually do have very high educational um, and economic accomplishments in this country. But the reason is that the immigration filters are set up so that only the smartest and most successful and best resourced Asians are even allowed in this country. If you actually went back to Asia, if you went to India, or if you went to Korea, if you went to China, or wherever else, they wouldn't all be, you know, math and science people playing the violin. They wouldn't all be computer science engineers. Those are the only people left allowed in this country. Right, so you're talking about, you're trying to act as this like some biological or cultural difference between Asians and other groups and not realizing there's actually an immigration filter where Asians are coming here voluntarily for educational academic opportunities as opposed to involuntarily on slave ships. Okay, that's, that's a very important difference to name here. Now this is, one, this is what gets very complicated for Asians is because when we come here, Everybody excludes us. We're invisible, and we're marginalized, and we know nobody cares about us. And so what then happens is white folks come up to us and say, ah, you're the good model minority. We like you better than we like black folks. We like you better than we like the brown folks. And a lot of Asians feel so vulnerable, and they feel so scared that white people aren't going to like them either, that they play to that. It's a real temptation for Asians to play to whiteness and try to be honorary whites or adjacent whites like Sarah shared earlier without realizing that we're actually being used in this game to hold down black and brown folks. So one of the things that Ray and I and Jay and Julia and, and David and I are, are trying to do with our Asian American community is to see the bigger picture and say, we do not want to be used in that way because white power structures actually don't care about Asians. Mm -hmm. right. This isn't about celebrating Asians. It's about pushing down black folks. Mm -hmm. The model minority myth is more about pushing down black folks than it is elevating Asian folks. But we let ourselves get played by that, and now we're starting to understand as we look at Atlanta, as we look at COVID, as we look at the way that we're racialized, that we're getting used in this whole thing, and we've been on the wrong side this whole time. We've been trying to play to the power structures as opposed to opposing them. That's something that I've learned through my black community. Asian Americans are mostly recent immigrants to this country. 
So there have been Asian Americans here since the mid-1800s and even earlier, but the biggest population has come since 1965. And that means that we just haven't been here that long, a lot of us. We also haven't been as big of a population. And we don't have the same history of activism that African American communities have. We don't have the same level of heroes that African Americans have, like a Martin Luther King, like a Frederick Douglass, like a Harriet Tubman. We don't have these heroes in the same kind of way. And when our parents came over here, they thought that this is a land of opportunity and freedom, and if Asians just kept their heads down and worked hard, then we would eventually advance and people would accept us. But now my generation's coming to age, and we're saying, that's not really happening. My kids are gonna be racialized just like I was. Even though I was born and raised in this country, I have US citizenship, English is my native language, my kids are not going to be assimilated into this country because of the color of their skin, the way they look. That's right. And that's something that I'm coming to grips with. I always thought the promise was, oh, if I just go to good schools, if I just work hard, then people accept me, but I'm starting to see that's not gonna happen with my kids. And so that's, that's something that I think a lot of Asian Americans are starting to realize right now. And as we're looking for resources and how to think about these things, the number one place that we're turning is the black church. Because the black church has had this long history of oppression. Yeah. It is, to quote Isabel Wilkerson, right? So um, Reverend Moss talked about Isabel Wilkerson. Beautiful book, Warmth of Other Sons. I sign it every year at Wheaton College. She's got this book called Cast, and she talks about how cast relies on the lowest rung. Yep. There's got to be somebody at the bottom so that everybody above them tries to prevent they, they just, they don't care about the bottom. They just want to make sure they're not the bottom rung. And they'll throw the bottom rung under the bus as long as it means that they work their way up. And that bottom rung in America is African Americans. Yeah. Yeah. So that is the history of African Americans. It's a very unique history amongst all racial groups. But then there's an extraordinary history of activism and self-determination and self-advocacy. And so Asians are increasingly turning to African American sources to see how have they done it? What can we learn from them? During this last few weeks after Atlanta, I think for a lot of Asian Americans, we've been going through a year of anti-Asian racism because of COVID, but then Atlanta happened and it really exploded things for us. Yeah. We are hurting yeah. and feeling very vulnerable because of what has happened. And I think because Asian Americans do not have the same developed language and concepts about race, we sometimes don't even know what to do with ourselves. We're just wondering, you know, wh what do we do? We didn't know we were this vulnerable. In a lot of Asian American churches, they're even struggling to know how to talk about this kind of incident when we ourselves are the victims. But one of the things that's been very interesting for me has been how many of our African American friends from our church have called us, texted us, emailed us, visited us at our homes, and they said, I see you, yep. I know what's going on, Whoa. and guess what, I've been there. I get it. Yep. That's been very powerful. I just have to say, this night, it's a very spiritual experience for me to see the African-American community come out in solidarity for Asians is very, very powerful because we feel invisible, we feel vulnerable, we feel marginalized. But I feel stronger knowing that this community is at my side. I felt stronger knowing that my church was at my side. I felt stronger knowing that folks who have been through it have been right there at my side supporting us. And so I just want to say that we are in this together. We as Asian Americans are learning the way that we play a special role in this racial hierarchy and the way that we can be used for good or the way that we can be used for bad. And we, the Asians on this panel, are working in our communities to get us on the right side. And we need other people of color, we need the black community to support us and to help us. And I just want to thank you for this evening because that is what I've received tonight 
And I just, I feel empowered to be with you tonight.